Hi everyone, Dan Cassidy here. Welcome to Top of the Morning on the UBS Market Moves podcast channel. It is Friday morning, that means we will recap the week that was and preview the week ahead here on the Weekend Review Preview edition of Top of the Morning. Uh, Joining us for the conversation this week, glad to welcome back Leslie Falconio, Head of Taxable Fixed Income Strategy Americas with the UBS Chief Investment Office. So Leslie, good morning, welcome back and thank you for dropping by this week. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate it. So, Leslie, as you know, investors this past week, they were faced with further market swings. So I'm curious as to what the market drivers were behind this week's movement. And how did fixed income assets in particular, Leslie, perform? Well, I mean, you, you know, you hit the nail on the head when, they, when, when it comes to volatility. And I think that's, that's one of the, you know, headwinds to performance that we've been talking about since, you know, actually the end of last year and our expectation that interest rate volatility would continue into 2022, but obviously this has been much beyond our expectation, not only given the large shift that we've seen in the terms of the hawkish Fed, but also what's happening in China and Russia, Ukraine. All of these are, you know, really putting a lot of volatility, not only within interest rates, but also with things with, you know, inflation expectations. So when we look at some of the moves this week, I mean, you know, last week we, we had a blackout period that starts from the Fed, right? Because we have the May 4th meeting, so they're not allowed to make commentary. But, you know, last week's move, we had a lot of, of comment, you know, we did have some Fed commentary which pushed that 10-year yield to overnight around that 297, which is, you know, something that is just teetering towards that 3%. You know, and this week, it's really been about what the market's expectation of what the Fed's going to say, the outlook in terms of trying to um, have a clear path, whether or not we've actually gone through peak inflation. And obviously, you know, the market now is also going to, you know, respond a little bit more to the action in the equity market. So, you know, we're back up in terms of, Treasury yields to that 290 level, given some strength that we saw in this morning's, um, you know, ECI and things like that. But what we're seeing is a reengagement of the flattening of the yield curve, you know, meaning that as we get closer to that Fed Fed meeting, you know, and the expectations that, you know, the Fed goes um, a bit more aggressively, if you will, than that neutral two and a half percent, you know, we have that, you know, a bit, a bit of a flattening of the yield curve. And when it comes to, you know, the fixed income performance, I mean, you know, with the the overall, you know, uh, fundamentals that were in things like IG and high yield, you know, when it comes to, you know, interest coverage ratios, defaults, you know, all these kinds of performance variables actually are dictating a soft landing. However, we have seen this week, you know, a bit of you know, capitulation in terms of having some spread widening within the sectors. I mean, they're still, if you look historically, they're still very tight. You know, and over on the, the 30th percentile for high yield and maybe around the 50th percentile for investment grade going back to, you know, 1997. But they're actually, they're starting to succumb a little bit to business volatility, particularly the volatility within the equity market. Well, Leslie, thank you for hitting on those market drivers and sharing with us some observations. I do want to run with interest rates for a few moments. You did mention rates and a highlight for our listeners, our clients, how you did release this week a blog updating on interest rates here in the U.S. Can you take a few moments, Leslie, just expanding on that for us? Yeah, I mean, you know, we always say, and we've said this, and it's very common, it's not about the level of the rates, how quickly you get there, and that velocity, right? And there's no question when we think about, I mean, think about this. Last week, as we mentioned, we got to a 2.97 10-year yield, right? That's almost a 3%. So when you think about the fact that we started at a 1.5% 10-year yield at the beginning of the year, that's almost a 100% increase. You've almost gone through three handles, a 1%, a 2%, a 3% within the first 15 weeks. Um, and that is just something that is, you know, I, I want to put it near unprecedented, you know, and, you know, given the fact how quickly we have moved, you know, we just think that this is a bit um, getting ahead of themselves, given the fact that they've, the Fed has only gone 25 basis points. You know, we recognize there is a tremendous amount of uncertainty regarding whether or not we've actually passed the peak inflation, you know, this past month. And we understand that there are, you know, things such as energy and, you know, all these supply chain bottlenecks and everything that we're seeing that could cause to have inflation maybe last a little higher for longer. But the market is really taking that to two or three steps further. And one of one of the, you know, sort of points that we have alluded to is that, you know, our view is that, you know, we've been what we call bearish 
for since since May of 2020 with the expectations that yields would rise. And now that we've gone back to these levels that you're seeing in terms of, you know, this this, this 2018 level in 10-year yields, you know, this kind of quick normalization, you know, we are sort of what we call becoming less short, right? We are less bearish on the market. You know, we think that it's fully priced in. You know, we cannot guarantee that you're not going to see the high of December 2000, December 2018, which is three, 325, 326, because it's so dependent on how the path of inflation goes over the next, you know, six, eight months. But we do feel that the magnitude of the move has been just so fast and so great, and they're pricing in such level of hawkishness, including quantitative tightening, that now it's just, it's it doesn't, real the risk reward is doesn't benefit as much to be what we call short, right? So we're just, we're just not having that kind of position. We're not saying that you should, you know, barrel along into interest rates right now, even though we find them to be very attractive yield, yield wise, only because the momentum is not in your favor, only because there's so much uncertainty over the next several months. But more than likely, we're going to see, you know, this kind of pullback. So market is already pricing in 50 for May, 50 for June, 50 for July. And whether we agree with that or not, that's the market expectation. Leslie, thank you for the perspective on rates. I do, of course, want to get to the Fed in a few moments, though quickly, uh, curious from an allocation standpoint, Leslie, how are you recommending that fixed income investors be positioned at this time? Well, listen, we, we've taken, you know, we, you know, we, we, Sort of, we closed our senior loan position for two reasons. One was because, obviously, given our view that rates would rise, you know, early on, the allocation had done very well. It's not that you know we're concerned about you know a credit event or the fundamentals within the sector is you know flagging concern. It was merely more the fact that we had felt that you know interest rates had risen enough, particularly in the short end. So if we look at the magnitude of how much, say, two-year yields have gone up, you know, we've had this, you know, 180, 190, I mean, 190 base point move, this really, you know, large moves in the short end, right, because of this pricing in such a hawkish Fed, that now it just appears that investors can be, you know, are earning, you know, a very good incremental income or carry by going from floating to fixed. So one of the things that we have, have allocated towards is like we like this one to three year in terms of IG corporates and we, we wrote about that in, in last month's fixed income strategist, you know, simply because we understand that when people sort of shift to the short end, you go on the short end because, you know, it's not a big total return play because it's short. You don't have a lot of interest rate risk, but you kind of want to earn that incremental carry. You look for preservation of capital, but because of the move was so stretched and so so severe in the short end, like the two-year treasury, given the market's quick shift in terms of a hawkish Fed, you had two-year yields just rise a tremendous amount. And that's sort of what we call principal protection for the short term was a bit disappointing, right? Because you had a negative total return in, the, in, those, in that area of the yield curve. So right now, what we're saying, well, because of that, we do believe that most of that headwind is behind us, and we because we don't think you're going to, you know, double in two year, you know, treasury yields. We don't think, you know, the Fed fund rate at the end of the year is going to be a three and a half, three seventy five. That's not our point of view, you know. So we do think that right now it's a good time to just you put a little cash to work, earn a little incremental carry, and because most of that interest rate headwind is behind us in the short end, in our opinion, we have a, a better ease of that principal protection going forward. Now, the second thing is, is that one of the asset classes that we invest in is, is on the preferred side. I mean, preferreds had really underperformed, not only in terms of their interest rate exposure, right, because they are longer interest rate risk and rates rose, but they were also a sector that's, that experienced a lot of spread widening, which we hadn't seen or haven't seen in other sectors. Yes, spreads have widened, but they haven't really widened an amount that is something that is notable or, or one that you would flag. Preferreds, however, rose and have widened and spread pretty quickly. So we have that sector as well versus governments, right? So it's not just, you're not just going for it's preferreds versus a government allocation. Um, so that's one, of the, well, that's one of the sectors that we have as well. But the problem with that we're seeing right now with a lot of the fixed income sectors is that continuous volatility is always very tough in the short term for their performance. But on the other side of that, the opportunity set within fixed income is so wide now and you're able to earn much better yield and much better carry that the whole premise of having go to go down the credit curve to earn your yield 
is no longer a sort of is no longer a force in terms of fixed income investors. And that's a benefit because right now, as we as the Fed continues to hike. As the economy will slow, you know, going to that up in credit, a little bit better credit, credit quality is something that, that investors should really consider because you're earning attractive yields now. Well, Leslie, thank you for the guidance there on allocation and speaking to the rationale behind the recent shifts as per the latest fixed income strategist publication. Getting back to the Fed for a few moments, I know the Fed has been silent this week as we head into next week. Key Fed meeting on Tuesday and Wednesday. We will receive the policy a decision on Wednesday of next week. What are CIO's expectations, Leslie? You know, we're expecting for 50 basis points, uh, you know, on the on the next meeting. That's pretty much baked in. And and I think that that's not going to be necessarily, you know, a major surprise. I think what the, what the market will look for is a guide or indication of maybe what the next two meetings might hold. It, it, could, they, could they do the 50 in June? Are they guiding towards, you know, the 50 could come, you know, in July as well? And I think that's really what the market will be looking for because they, they are, we are expecting, and as is the market, the 50 basis points in May. And obviously, we're looking for a little bit more of a um, uh, a clear set, a, a clear sort of start to QT. I mean, people are most you know, we're expecting June, as most are, and I think that that's really going to be the key in terms of how they clarify, you know, quantitative tightening because we already know the amount of the ninety five billion. Um, so that'll be really the key to what to what the market's looking for. But it's really going to be the language and the guidance going forward as to whether or not, yes, the market is pricing, you know, 50 June and July, whether or not it goes more 50, whether the 50 goes, that 50 might change to 75 or it might might go to 25. So I think it's really the guidance going forward is really what the market's going to look for. And again, the market is pricing in right now 350. So it's going to be, you know, 50 May, 50 June, 50 July, which, you know, and then they've got to sort of wait and see, but it's going to be the language that people are looking at whether or not that sort of path is aggressive or not. Aside from the Fed next week, Leslie, anything else taking place that you'll be keeping an eye on? Well, listen, we have the refunding announcement. Let's be honest. I mean, it's, it's everything else is going to be irrelevant, you know, compared to really what the Fed is doing. I mean, obviously, there's, I mean, you know, in terms of long term, I think like ISM is going to be very important, of course. But I mean, there's really going to be, you know, what the what the Fed is. And also, too, the refunding. I mean, the refunding comes in the same on the same day around the Fed as well. Um, and that's going to be uh, a big um it's, uh, it's, it's important for the market because this is sort of how the market's going to get an idea of they're expecting them to cut issuance, meaning how much supply comes into the marketplace. But a lot of this sort of QT and refunding are going to start to come together to see exactly how much supply will come into the market at the end of this year in 2023 and where it will. So it's assuming right now you'll have things like an increase in T-bill issuance, which would be not have a, a large impact on the market versus if it was a 10 year, but those are going to be the key things. And obviously, you know, besides, you know, this isn't necessarily next week, but the next true key will be on the 11th, which is the CTI. Well, thank you, Leslie. Very productive conversation here on a Friday morning to cap off what was a very busy week. A lot to look out for in the week ahead and plenty there that we can indeed follow up on, though. Wish you a nice weekend ahead, Leslie, and thank you again for your time and insights this morning. Always appreciate it. Thanks, Dan. Much appreciated. Have a great weekend. Today, we've been joined by Leslie Falconio, Head of Taxable Fixed Income Strategy Americas with the UBS Chief Investment Office. As a reminder to our clients and their listeners, the UBS Chief Investment Office a does author a variety of publications and blogs that touch on timely market developments, asset classes, and portfolio allocation. Uh, these resources can all be located on UBS.com forward slash CIO. So that includes that recent blog from Leslie Falconio, uh, which talks about interest rates. So that title is U.S. Fixed Income, U.S. Interest Rates Update. So for clients of UBS, uh, simply reach out to your financial advisor if you would like to receive a copy of that blog directly. A top of the morning is part of the UBS Market Moves podcast channel, which is available where podcasts are found, including on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn, Stitcher, and Pandora. Visit UBS.com forward slash studios to view the entire podcast offering, as well as the new UBS trending video series. From UBS Studios, I'm Dan Cassidy. Thank you for joining us. 
UBS Chief Investment Office's investment views are prepared and published by the Global Wealth Management Business of UBS AG or its affiliate, UBS. This material has no regard to the specific investment objectives, financial situation, or particular needs of any specific recipient and is published for informational purposes only. As a firm providing wealth management services to clients globally, UBS AG and its subsidiaries offer both investment advisory services and brokerage services. Investment advisory services and brokerage services are separate and distinct, differ in material ways, and are governed by different laws and separate arrangements. In the USA, UBS Financial Services, Inc. is a subsidiary of UBS AG and a member of FINRA SIPC. For information, please visit our website at ubs.com forward slash working with us. For a full legal disclaimer applicable to the independent investment views produced by UBS, please visit our website at ubs.com forward slash CIO disclaimer.